Okay, Alan, you thought you had a uh, long introduction. <laughs> Look, folks, um, when Harry and Neil asked me um, to come to the session today, I have a, a skill I'm trying to develop of saying no, but this was an easy one because for, for me over the last 20 or 30 years, um, Crest, certainly through the work of Eva Baker and, um, and, and the, the group that's been, been here, uh, Bob Lynn has been dramatic in terms of the contribution that this centre has made to the way in which we think about education. And certainly the message has always been, if you want to know what's happening in the future, watch what's happening in Crest right now. So thank you for what you've been doing and thank you for inviting me here today. And the theme I've been given is to talk about the big ideas on education in terms of the evidence. I have 10. The first big idea is we've got to stop asking what works. It's killing us as a profession. I'm sick and tired of people who come to me usually three or four times a week with the latest app, the latest resource, the latest game, the latest, you name it. And they say, oh, teachers love it, kids love it. We are absolutely surrounded by things that work. And it's the wrong question. We need to change the question to the relative question, what works best? For example, what I've been doing over the last 20 years as a bit of a hobby is trying to address this question about relative effects. Because my observation has been that everybody I've met in education, from a teacher, from a teacher educator, from an academic, from a developer, they all know what works and they all claim to have evidence what works. Doesn't make sense. Have you ever met a teacher who has said they're below average? So what I've been doing is I'm now up to 1,400 meta-analyses. I have over a quarter of a billion students in the sample that ask this question. And when I look at the distribution, you can see that the zero point, there's hardly anything that we do to kids that harm them. Isn't that good news? <laughs> and some of these down here in this red zone make perfect sense, such as the effect size of bullying on achievements minus 0.2. Kind of expect that. And when you take that into account, 95 to 98% of things that we do to kids enhances their learning. All you need to enhance achievement is a pulse. <laughs> Stop saying it works. This is why it's killing us. Because every politician comes up with an idea, it will work. And so when I see teachers who say, this is my kids' performance at the start of the year, this is their performance at the end of the year. Those are the teachers I want to drum out of the profession, because everybody can do that. So don't come to me and say, I've got this new game, this new app, this new resource, this new teacher, this new school. And set as your criteria, can we enhance learning? Because it's just not very difficult to do at all. Obviously, my interest is I've set the average of all the effects and said, What's the story underlying the blue zone from the yellow zone? And the data was the easy part. It took me 15 years to write the first book to try and work out the interpretation of those data. Let me give you a hint. Look at those. There's a big range. Which ones would you want to back as being in the blue zone, above average? And which ones would you want to say are in the yellow zone, the below average? I bet there's a few pet themes in that list. And it turns out the yellow zone. Most of those are structural things, how we structure schools. Most of those are resources. Most of those are curricula. Most of those are assessments. Most of those are the structural things. They kind of don't matter much. On this side, it's dominated by teacher expertise and the expertise of adults. Dominates the system. But I put it to you that the majority of things that our politicians and our parents want for our schools are the things that don't matter as much. And it's only if you ask this relative question do you start to sort out some of the things that really do matter compared to the some that don't. And so I'm a great fan as a research design person of how we can bring more experimentation, the kind of things you're going to hear from Rich Meyer and the staff Luna about, how you can bring more research design back into the classroom 
I get to people to ask what the relative question, if I do this rather than that, as opposed to you must do this. My second big idea is how do you new upscaler? Because if you actually look at the distribution, and when I take into account with my measurement background, things like NAEP, no child left behind, it's not difficult to say in this country 50 to 60% of teachers and schools are already in the blue zone. Success is all around us. What we're not very good at is reliably identifying that success and then upscaling it. In fact, the visible learning model is very simple. We work in around 5,000 schools around the world at the moment, and we spend quite a bit of time at the first period learning who's in the blue zone. And we do it through assessment, yes. We do it through student voice. We do it through classroom observations. We triangulate. And sometimes you find your 30-year out veterans in the yellow zone and your two-year out teachers in the blue zone. And then the question is, does the school principal have the courage to form a coalition of the successful and then invite those in the yellow to join? It's that simple. And what we find is that teachers are very hungry to identify the success that's all around them. The answer isn't in Finland. The answer isn't in Singapore. It's right around us. But we don't have much spine to do that. And I find it interesting, I'm not bad at literature searching, and I think I can find uh, at most five articles ever written in our history on upscaling success. So please don't come and tell me you've got the latest solution. Come and tell me how you're upscaling it. Otherwise, your solution's just going to disappear as the other 2,000 million solutions have in education over the last 30 years. It's an upscaling question of success. The third big idea is how do we change our rhetoric so we have as our mantra that every child deserves at least a year's growth for a year's input. And when I actually go back and analyse that, and I analyse the NAEP, I analyse the SATs in England, I analyse NAPLAN in Australia and EASTL in New Zealand, and ask the question, what is the average typical year's growth for a year's input? It turns out from those data, separate from the visible learning data, to be exactly 0 0.40 in every country. Yes, it differs at different age groups and there's slightly different things, etc. But on average, it's not bad. So we know what the blue zone is. Those are the teachers and schools where the kids are getting greater than a year's growth for a year's input. And so my argument is, how can we then get our teachers to have a common understanding of what that year growth is? And I deliberately talk about the learning lives of children, because that includes more than achievement. It includes trying to make schools inviting places for kids to come back to. Because the biggest predictor of adult health, wealth, and happiness is not achievement at school. It's the number of years of schooling. So there's a massive obligation on us to make schools inviting places for kids to learn. In the last few years in Australia, I've actually taken on a new job. I've um, added uh, a new job. I've, I've taken a political appointment. I'm a cabinet appointee. Uh, and I'm a chair of an organisation, the only organisation the government actually owns, the Australian Institute for Teachers and School Leadership, and it has the very grandiose responsibility, I'm in charge of the quality of teachers, uh, school leaders, and teacher education across Australia. And it's really interesting when you sit on that side of the table now, and you hear people coming to you, and what they're speaking about. And one of the killers is they all want high achievement. Now what possibly could be wrong with high achievement? Well, it's actually killing us as a system. And we look at PISA, and we look up at Finland and Singapore, and we notice Australia's going backwards, and we get worried about high achievement. Now, I can then speak to my colleagues and political friends, and I can speak to the unions, and I can speak to the principals associations, and say, but wait a moment, you're actually not employed for high achievement by itself. In fact, for many of your schools, the kids already start with high achievement. They deserve a year's growth for a year's input too. And yes, I can talk to them about progress and value added, and you've had that debate in this country too. And they all agree. And then you walk out of the room and they go back, you've got to have high standards, you've got to have high achievement. Parents chase schools with high achievement. We have a website that the government runs that lists every school in the country that has their achievement levels. And so what I've learned is you don't talk about achievement, you don't talk about a progress as if they're separate. So we've put them together, and we have this chart that we locate every school, actually we locate every kid. 
And so what we're arguing is that up there, where you have high achievement, low growth, is cruising. Obviously, you don't want to be down here. Over here is high growth and low achievement, and obviously optimal up there. And here's the argument. The big idea is, how do we stop parents and politicians thinking that good schools are those schools? High achievement schools, because they're not. Those schools, and we have more of them in Australia than any other country in the world, and the reason we've been going backwards for the last 20 years in PISA is simply because the, we're failing with our top 40% of our kids. Good schools are those schools. Some of our best schools in this country, and in my country, are those schools that are in our lowest socioeconomic areas. That's adding massive growth. Our Aboriginal schools in the Northern Territory, in Cape York, they're adding three years of growth for every year of input. Now, the bad news is it's not enough. They have to get up to five years to catch up. But who wouldn't say those are stunning schools? But because their kids are not above average, they are pushed and pulled. And they've just had another review, and they've just had another change, they've just had another silver bullet. But in the meantime, they've just killed off some of the best schools in the country. So the big idea is how do we shift the discussion to have progress to proficiency? There's the whole country, high school. Every school in the country is up there. And you can see our major problem is the number of schools that are above average that are cruising. You can see that we're actually not doing bad. We're actually better with kids. Our schools are better. Our teachers are better in our lower socioeconomic status schools. You'd never know it from our current, current rhetoric. And so this is why this notion of how do we get progress to achievement. We spent a lot of time looking at preschools. We've done a major study with 3,000 preschools across the country. And on a scale of 1 to 10, they get about a 7 or 8 on social and emotional development. On cognitive development, you're lucky if they get a 2. The scandal of early childhood, the billions of dollars we're wasting in early childhood, is criminal. We've given up 4 and 5 year olds. And in our science and learning work, we're spending all our time with 0 to 2s. When you look at, for instance, the simple answer, which is language, language, and language, and you look at the difference, and you have to admire that, because that's my first granddaughter. Isn't she cute? <laughs> if you look at, and she's been born, born in a world of expectations, how lucky she is. By the time she is one, the time she is three, she'll be exposed to have so many more words compared to if she was born in a welfare family. They're not my words, but you know what we meant, they mean. That difference is dramatic within two years. But the time Emma starts school at age five, compared to a kid who comes from a, a wealthier family, how many words will she be, have been exposed to? The difference, 30 million. By the time she's five, compared to a kid that comes from a less resourced family. And then we ask schools, try and fix them at age five? Wow. And so what we're doing a lot of work in, and this is where we're doing a lot of work in the technology space, the social media space, with parents, with kids, age zero to two, usually in very poor parts of the country, very impoverished parts of the, uh, the, our country, which if you've ever been to the north of Australia, it was pretty rough up there, with stunning success at getting the kids and getting the parents, sometimes to talk more to the kids than they've talked to their dogs. And then we also then did a follow-up, and we followed up kids. And we did a metasynthesis a few years ago, looking at the Matthew effect in reading. And the argument is, by age eight, if you haven't got the sufficient amount of reading, level two in PISA, you're hard to catch up. If you do have it, you have a faster pace. And I've never seen a set of data that is so clear from a policy perspective. If you don't get those minimal amounts of reading, or numeracy, by age eight, you virtually never catch up. Wow, the big idea is how do we get the education of parents, the education going at that zero to two level to really make it a real difference to those lives of kids because the band-aiding happens after that. But it comes back, if you go back to that list which I briefly put up earlier and you ask, you know, what is it that really makes the difference and it's not the structure of schools, it's not another curriculum, it's not another app, it's not another assessment. It's worrying about how those teachers think. In fact, I'm at the stage of my career now, I don't want to ever hear another debate, go to another session, 
and hear how we should teach. Couldn't care less. I care about the way teachers think about the impact of their teaching. And how do we move the discussion away from teaching to about their impact? And what I've been developing over the last few years is 10 mind frames, 10 different ways. Like, let me just give you a couple of examples. I want a teacher who walks into a room, a principal who walks into a staff room and says, my job here today is to understand the impact I have on kids. And wow, the kids are the beneficiaries. And certainly then it's that notion of how we can get teachers to become evaluators of their impact. How they can see themselves as my job is to cause learning. My job is to show kids up front what success looks like. Why is it such a secret that teachers, particularly when they get up to the university level, hide away what they think success is? And hey, he will give you a test in six weeks' time and you can guess and see whether you've got it right. No, how do you get those teachers to say, my job is to help kids see up front what success looks look like so that they're part and parcel of the learning equation? But they can't do it alone. The new number one in the whole visible learning um, hierarchy is teachers' collective efficacy. The ability of a principal to bring a school together so that the teachers collectively believe they can truly make a difference. And it has to be fed with the evidence that they do make a difference. Otherwise, it's just rah-rah stuff. And if you go into those schools, and there are plenty that are out there, you know immediately that everyone in that school is working together to make a difference to those kids. When we did the analysis in New Zealand a few years ago, when I had the data, we followed kids, which over a million of them, from age 8 to age 17, right through the schooling system. When we did the analysis and went back to the government, we said the single biggest problem in this country is teachers do not have a common conception of what progress is. And so the notion is how do we get schools to get teachers together so we understand how they think, what they think progress is? What do they think a, a good year six English is? What panel beating is like and what excellence is in panel beating at year 10 or whatever it is? Because if you don't have a common understanding of that, it's a random crapshoot. Every time a kid, it's a new teacher, whether they go up or down. And certainly the work we're doing now in the schools is we're doing a lot of work up front to build the trust, which you have to have, to then get the teachers to expose what they think challenges. As I said before, we don't care how they teach. It's a myth to believe there's a right way to teach or a wrong way to teach. But it's dramatically important to worry about how they think, what the challenges is. And certainly those teachers who have high expectations have them typically for all the kids. And teachers with low expectations are stunningly successful at dumbing kids down. So the big idea is how do we get to how teachers think about what their conception of progress is? How do you then develop that evaluative capacity? I don't have much time for action research, for saying teachers should be researchers. But I have a dramatic amount of time for saying teachers should be evaluators. And the difference is, under the research, you ask what is so, and under evaluation, you ask so what. There may be lots of reasons why a kid learns, but I'm much more interested in developing the teacher's skills to know that they're actually having an impact on kids. Because if they're not, those are the only people in the room that are paid to change and have come up with a different way of helping kids learn. These are some of the big notions. The effect sizes here are ginormous. These are all up around the 0.8s, 0.9s. There's teachers working together to be evaluators, to understand and move from where the kid is to what the explicit success criteria should be available to the kids. How you could do, and following certainly on from Alan's talk, how you can see errors is the essence of learning. And it's one of the biggest struggles we're doing in our research at the moment is to try and get the teachers to realise that errors are good things. And we've used productive failures, we've used lots of languages, we're learning, using the learning pit at the moment. Teachers are terrified when someone makes a mistake in class. Oh, it affects the kid's self-esteem. Now, come on. If you already know something, what's the point of learning? It's what you don't know that matters. And it's kind of like, I agree with Alan for the title of this uh, conference, Prove It. Should have been Disprove It. It's what it is we don't know, and how from then we can make the growth we need it. 
And so how do you build that evaluative capacity to get the system moving from progress to achievement? But to do that, I would argue the next big idea is to come to assessment. And I'm a measurement person, I'm a statistician, that's been my background. But clearly, I love assessments. But I also noticed, like many people have done, the billions of dollars we spent on assessments with very limited effect. And I would argue that the big idea is because we've failed to realise that assessments are not about the kids. Strange statement. But if you ask the big idea and say assessments is feedback to teachers about what their impact is, you see assessments quite differently. In fact, I was responsible for building the assessment scheme for all our elementary and high schools in New Zealand. And we started with the reports. And we started with a lot of focus groups, a lot of work in schools with teachers and parents and kids and principals trying to say, when you see a report like this, what do you see? And if they didn't see it correctly, we were wrong. And our second question was, and what, is the, what consequence? What would you do now? And if there was no consequence, if there was no subsequent action, the reports were wrong. Our first report took us 85 focus groups to even get close. I have no time for the concept of assessment literacy. It's an insulting phrase. It's saying to the teachers, you have to learn how our language, our psychometric language, because we're not good enough to learn your language. We also tried to minimise numbers. And what we did is we said, how do we get assessments to feedback to teachers? When we first implemented this, in the first four years, we gave the kids nothing. It was all to the teachers. It shows them what their impact is. It shows them if they're getting that year's growth. And certainly when the minister stood up on the first few days and said, look, if a kid doesn't move within six months from level one to level three, teachers, you're not doing your job. And I was sitting in the audience a little terrified that that would be the day that the system was dead. No, that was the day it came alive. Teachers are very hungry for that impact. And what I'm very proud of it's a voluntary system. Don't have to use it. 80%, excuse me, 80 of teachers and principals are using this tool today, 16 years later. I'd love to see someone have a tool in this country that lasts 16 years that teachers keep wanting. Why do they want it? Because it tells them about their impact. It also has taught them that the best way to create assessments is to create assessments where half the, ask question, half the questions the kids get right and half they get wrong. Because that's the best way to understand what you have to teach next or where you go to, what they know, the scaffolding to build onto where they don't know. And the whole system is built that way. There's somewhere between four and 600 million tests in there that they can get instantly. It can be done on the spot. New Zealand does not need a national system of testing. It doesn't need the one-year event. It gets it every day. <clears throat> My argument is, when you think of assessment as feedback to teachers, how do we move the debate away from teaching to learning? might seem a little trite in some ways, but I think it's a really critical one. And what we've been doing over the last three years is building a similar thing I did to the, to the visible learning where achievement was the outcome, whereas now we're looking at where learning strategies, how you learn. And it turned out it was not as simple as the achievement because there's massive moderators. And certainly the argument is we're making this difference between surface steep and transfer. Surface is the content. If you go back and look at the visible learning work, you'll see things like problem-based learning, uh, anything with the word deep in it, inquiry-based learning, is one of our most massive failures. Primarily because we introduce it too early. It works on that phase, it doesn't work in the surface level. And hey, you've got to have surface level knowledge and content before you can think about it and do problem solving. Unfortunately, 90% of what kids need to do in a classroom, they can do at the surface level. And then there's a massive difference between when you first encounter something to when you deliberately teach it. Sorry, when you deliberately then have to overlearn it. And certainly, as you can see, the strategies. Memorization's a massive failure at surface first exposing, but it's a dramatically success when you come down to rehearsal and practice, and so on. And what I find intriguing is that when we go in and we've gone into about 5,000 classes, we've taken transcripts of those classes to ask, where are instances where teachers teach kids how to think? Across those 5,000 hours, we could find, sorry, 5,000 teachers, we could find virtually none. We still love to teach the content. We still love to privilege those kids who can think fast, think slow appropriately, and say, oh, they're the bright kids. But how do we actually deliberately teach them? I think we can. I think we should. I think it's a critical part of it. And the tenth one 
and it comes back to my political hat on here and also comes back to the early childhood, is I'm dismayed at what parents want for their kids in schools. We've just done a survey of parents across Australia. We've given them a list from the visible learning work. It's got a negative correlation with what the evidence says. Unfortunately, kids don't vote. Don't blame the politicians. They're feeding the parents myths about what they want for their kids. They want better structures, better schools, more glass, prettier buildings, in and colour, in and on a computer. It doesn't make a difference compared to what really makes the difference. And so one of the things we have to do is we have to educate our parents more about what learning is. In fact, the report we wrote a few years ago is when parents learn the language of learning. So that they don't become the barrier to create schools that is a little better than the ones they went to as opposed to the ones our kids need. So folks, those are my 10 big ideas about what I've learned in terms of research over the last 20 or 30 years about how we can make a difference in this business. And it's all about how we change how we think about it. Thank you.